Every time I stub my toe, my wife laughs uproariously. Just one of those natural reactions she has to that particular thing. Now, it may be that the only way to brighten her otherwise down mood is to accidentally ram my foot into the couch corner, and I oblige fairly regularly as I have large feet, bigger couches, and I'm a tad on the clumsy side. Now, most of us have a little klutz in us. We chalk it up to a lack of coordination or of spatial awareness, and we go on with our day, maybe limping a little. But for others, possibly up to 8% of the Canadian population, this kind of thing happens more regularly. People for whom things like riding or riding a bike or tying our shoes is a bit of a struggle because our body has trouble doing what our brain is telling it to do. Now, my name is Eric Bowman. I'm the communications person at the Canadian Psychological Association, and this is Mindful. One of the things I like best about doing this podcast is that I get to learn about new things and then share those things with you. We've talked about subjects like vulvodynia and femphobia, notions I'd never heard of before I was with the CPA. Today, we're talking about Developmental Coordination Disorder, or DCD. This discussion set off a light bulb in my head, as I felt like it was describing my own kid, a kid who I taught to skate at age 11 and to ride a bike at the age of 18. DCD is a relatively unknown condition that maybe should be more well known in the public and, in particular, among medical professionals. Thankfully, we have one of those medical professionals joining us on Mindful today, one with just the right expertise to tell us all about DCD. My name is Pauline Camps. I'm a registered psychologist. What's kind of unique about me is I've got multidisciplinary training in not only psychology, but education kinesiology and physical education. So I really blend all of those things together in my work with children. So I have kind of a unique perspective when I look at little ones and older people. So education, kinesiology, psychology, all of this comes together and makes you an expert in something called DCD, which until we corresponded, I had never heard of in my entire life. This is a brand new concept for me. So I'm hoping that you can explain what DCD stands for and what it is. I'm thrilled to do that, Eric. DCD stands for Developmental Coordination Disorder. This is a credible mental health condition. It's been in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual since 1987 in every edition. 1987, 1994, 2000, 2013, 2022. The prevalence rate of DCD has been consistently reported at 5 to 6% in all of those editions of the DSM. Just in the last version of the DSM, it, the new rate is 7 to 8% in Canada. It is highly under-recognized or seldom diagnosed by mental health practitioners because they also don't know a whole lot about it. The people who see DCD are not allowed to make the diagnosis. So if I can just explain a little bit more, often the very first um, allied health professionals that see the effects of DCD would be speech language pathologists. And they might see some issues with oral motor so the child may have problems with speech sound production. They can't get the muscles of their mouth to move efficiently and quickly. So many of these children have like lisps or slurs, or they have really disfluent speech. They might breathe at the wrong time when they're talking. So if, if I can just give a little example, they may breathe in the wrong part of a sentence. Okay. Oftentimes, they're, um, when they're stressed, their vocal cords may go a little <clears throat> higher like mine are right now with the smoke in Calgary. And so many of them have some kind of unusual speech issues, but they truly understand what's going on. They just have a difficult time expressing it efficiently and quickly. Then the next allied professional that typically sees a child with coordination difficulties would be an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist. When a child struggles to hold a pen or a pencil correctly, use two hands, that's coordination, to cut, to cut a piece of paper, to tie their shoelaces, learning how to ride a bicycle, learning how to use utensils, dressing yourself, buttons, zippers. So one of the diagnostic criteria for DCD 
is that it affects a child's activities of daily living. And that can be eating, dressing, even toileting requires a lot of planning and motor coordination to go to the bathroom, take down your pants, lift up your skirt, whatever, um, he, get the signals from your body to go to that part of the body. Okay. Eliminate, clean up, turn on the taps, wash your hands, get it all right. Huge amount of coordination required in these. And a lot of parents don't actually ponder that this can be a disorder. Um, in the classroom, many of these children lean on their desks because they've got often a bit of low tone. So they may be fidgety and wiggly youngsters because they need to activate the muscles in their trunk region to sit properly. That can be misdiagnosed as um, ADHD. But they're often resting their head or they they get tired of writing. They may shake their hands because there's a cramp in it. Um, they may refuse printing, coloring, and writing tasks because they don't want to be ridiculed by their peers. It's kind of all these subtle little things that unless you've got a back, like a really solid training in that motor area, many mental health professionals may kind of dismiss it or they think it's part of another condition. So speech language pathologists see it with oral motor. Physiotherapists would probably see it in gross motor, running, throwing, kicking, catching, jumping, riding a bicycle. Those are typically acquired later. And then when they do learn the skills, often it's a bit clumsy. It's not fully controlled. It's not graceful. It takes excessive amount of time to learn. And then the fine motor would be your occupational therapists. But psychologists would see these children struggle with processing speed, because the fascinating part about DCD, even though it's considered a motor disorder, it really affects all aspects of human functioning. And so in many ways, I'm, I'm a bit distressed that the American Psychiatric Association has defined it only as a motor disorder. Certainly it's evidenced motorically early on in the child's life, right. but it affects cognitive processing, it affects uh, the speed and the efficiency with which you engage with other people, especially if there's ocular motor issues. So many of these children, the muscles in the eyes aren't fully teamed or coordinated. The sight, the child may have some muscle difficulties in all of the muscles in the eyes. That can affect how quickly their eyes can focus. It can affect how well they can maintain focus when they're looking at others. And if it takes their eyes longer to focus in a social setting, typically classmates don't hold a, a smile or a facial gesture for a long period of time. And then if the child with coordination difficulties is looking at the child to try to read their facial expression, they may get mocked by the you know, classmates saying, why are you staring at me? Like, that's weird. Like, don't look at me. So in many subtle ways, these children are really misunderstood in school. And then when they're struggling and they, they get upset because they, they don't understand what's wrong, they're trying their best, they're trying their hardest. And then people may judge them for you, know, you being a bit lazy, you're not working fast enough, your work's not tidy, you need to redo it. And then the child with coordination difficulty gets very upset and frustrated and confused because they have tried their hardest and it's not good enough. Anyways, it's such a fascinating topic and it spills, um, not again, not only motor issues, but cognitive processing. Because if you think about, you have to coordinate a lot of things when you are planning um, a response to any kind of a task. I believe that DCD is the only condition in the DSM, in the neurodevelopmental disorders, that talks about executing tasks. So I happen to believe that we have a lot of people talking about executive functioning difficulties. I think really it sits in the world of DCD. So it being a, you know, coordination issue, right? Having trouble picking up a pencil, having trouble cutting up a piece of paper, that sort of thing, because the coordination isn't quite there. 
how do you differentiate between what is DCD and what's just sort of natural clumsiness or an inability to, or just some, someone who's naturally uncoordinated, right? I, I played sports my whole youth and some of us were better at some things than others and some just weren't that coordinated and, you know, couldn't make contact with the ball or with the bat, right? I can't imagine that that would fall under the same umbrella. What, how do you differentiate between the one and the other? Excellent question. So the thing about DCD is you have to rule out that the child has had sufficient opportunities to learn and practice. So if you have a youngster, I think, again, I happen to be a parent. And when you see a little one who's a bit clumsy and uncoordinated, it's actually kind of cute. Like yeah. they're stumbling, yeah. they're falling, It's they bump into things and everyone has a good little haha about that. But as that child gets older, that's actually not very funny. It it starts to affect their, their thoughts about themselves. And we can get parents start to get pretty frustrated pretty quickly if someone's often spilling the orange juice or they've dropped something or they've they can't get into their car seat and do up their belt buckles fast enough. So if a child has had sufficient opportunities and doesn't master those skills, then you might say there's something really going on. And as for the difference between a child who plays sports and those who doesn't, when you see youngsters just kind of walking around the side of this play field or the schoolyard, because they have tried to play soccer and typically the young children will let them try it the first couple of times. But if the child with coordination difficulties never kicks the ball properly or when they try and it goes in the wrong direction or they shoot it down the wrong, towards the wrong net, mm -hmm. uh, the other children are pretty quick to kind of, oh no, we've got enough players the next time. And these children want to master the skills but it becomes a bit of a sport when the athletes recognize someone is a bit weaker in that field and then they'll just race ahead of them or try to exclude them in ways and so the child who turns into a youth or a teenager these are often the the individuals who are the last ones picked for phys ed if they even go to phys ed class because when you start thinking about all the things that are necessary, you got to get into the class quick enough. You got to change your clothes quickly. Then you typically race out to the gym. You get whatever is the best ball or the best badminton racket. That's what the athletes grab. So the child who's a little bit delayed or a little bit slower in all of these things ends up with poor equipment choices and I can say this because I'm a phys ed person, like my first degree was physical education and my master's was in um, kinesiology and my whole PhD was on motor learning in the psychomotor domain. So I can say this about phys ed people. We happen to be drawn to the athlete. You want to see them get better. You see the natural talent and you want them on the team and so so on and so forth. So many times these children are just kind of left over in the corner of the gymnasium and people aren't spending a lot of attention with them. And then if, if the teacher doesn't really observe them playing, they may just mark them as satisfactory on a report card when really they have been struggling. It sounds though you're describing what ends up happening as a result of this condition and, and children who have it, and then they end up getting excluded from sports and so on. If they were included from the beginning, and if the other children on the playground brought them in to play soccer every day, even if they weren't as good as the rest of the kids, if the phys ed instructor paid closer attention to them and brought them into the game and, and gave them the right equipment and all this sort of thing, would they get better? Is this something that can improve with repetition or is it something that is just not something they'll ever master without some sort of external help? These are an absolutely fantastic group of individuals to work with because they're bright. That's one of the diagnostic. If I can just quickly back up and go over the diagnostic criteria, they must have average to above average intelligence. They have to display some motor difficulties in the early years. So in the early developmental years. The motor difficulties must not be due to a visual impairment. 
or any other neurological condition like cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, some of those. It has to impact the child's life at home, activities of daily living. It must affect academic achievement, so in school, classroom performances. It does affect play. It does affect leisure. It can affect pre-employment training and employment opportunities. And then the consequences end up becoming physical health, mental health. But your question about will these children benefit? Absolutely. But they typically need quite a unique approach. Occupational therapy and physiotherapy and speech language, many of them learn to speak and enunciate words properly with that kind of support. And then with some early intervention with occupational therapists and physiotherapists, gains are made. Unfortunately, the way most school systems are set up, and I can say that because I worked in multiple schools, many of those supports and services are withdrawn or they're significantly reduced at grade one, exactly when the child needs extra help. So they can get better. They do need some extra treatment and support or programming and support for how to address some of their difficulties. But because they're bright and they intuitively understand that if I learn these skills, I'm going to be included more socially. So they're highly, highly motivated. You said one of the diagnostic criteria was that the symptoms that we observe can't be due to a visual impairment, right? That the visual impairment isn't causing this. You also said earlier, though, that this can cause a form of visual impairment where the eye muscles are not working exactly the way that they do for the rest of us. How does one determine which is the case? How can you tell, especially in someone as young as an infant, whether it's a visual issue or a muscle issue within the eyes? And are those two things different? I mean, are if your muscles in your eyes aren't working, is that not considered a visual impairment? Yeah, that's part of the dilemma in the diagnostic criteria. I don't think the people who at the American Psychiatric Association who have formalized these criteria over the years actually um, had the opportunity to study this from a clinical perspective. So I've been working in this field for over 20 years, and I chose to work in the clinical realm because I was just absolutely fascinated about this. And it took me, I'm sorry to say, I'm a bit of a slow learner myself. It took me many years to say, you know what? Some of these children have got a lazy eye, or they've got slightly crossed eyes, or they've got kind of a wandering eye, like ambly amblyopia, which is a lazy eye. Some of them have got really, really tiny fluctuations of like almost a trembling of the eye muscle. And then you can see that the eyes aren't working in a team fashion. I think it's not clearly described in the diagnostic criteria, Eric, but I think it would be like if you had a single eye or if you had, like if you were blind, of course, that's going to affect your motor skills. It will affect your balance. It will affect your depth perception, your ability to track a ball, those right. kinds of things. But many of these subtle difficulties also affect reading because you've got to track properly and the, and the eyes have to stop every so many times as you're following a line of text. The difficulty with the eye teaming can affect your work when you're doing multiple choice questions, things like that. So any really fine activity, you'll often see these children really, really leaning over their papers or they'll lean back or they'll, they'll use one eye, almost like a dominant eye. It's really fascinating. But having worked in this field for so long, you start to see the little adaptations that these youngsters develop on their own. So mm -hmm. in response to your question, it's not really clear what the APA says. So what I do when I'm working with this population is I will always ask the parents to have their children's vision assessed by a regular optometrist. If it comes back at 2020 visual acuity, then I would say that that's not a, a formal impairment. However, most often I will ask parents to go back and have testing done by a developmental optometrist and I'll give them a whole list of things to look at from that ocular motor perspective and often there's some subtle 
things or the developmental optometrist will come back and say, yes, there is an issue with binocular vision or there is an issue with divergence or convergence efficiency. There is an issue with, you know, some of the subtle muscles in the eyes. You said earlier that at one point it was five to six percent of people, now seven to eight percent in Canada and who who have this condition. And I presume that most of them are not being diagnosed with it since I have never heard of this. So how does one come up with this number that it's one in 20 people or one in 15 people? How did they determine that that is the rate of prevalence of this in our population? There are some fantastic researchers around the world who study this population, and they've come up with the the prevalence rate. There was an amazing group working out of McMaster University at Hamilton, Ontario. They received some significant federal funding many years ago. They have all kinds of resources around DCD, but that was typically a research group. There's also a really, really um, strong research group out in Vancouver at the Sunny Hill um, Pediatric Center. And they also just, you know, nose to the grindstone in the area of research. But because there are so few people diagnosing, the numbers are actually coming from the researchers rather than the clinicians. I think, unfortunately, that the clinicians may be misidentifying certain students, like the wiggly one um, who's fidgety and always wiggly, may actually have problems with focus and attention. I I mean, may have problems with DCD rather than ADHD. I also suspect that some children who are being excluded socially or being mocked because of their weak skills or they're having these emotional meltdowns because they're struggling so much in school. And when they ask the teacher for help or they're saying to the teacher, Johnny wouldn't let me on the slide, they keep running ahead of me and that's repeated two or three days in a row, that that's considered rigid thinking or oppositional behavior, or that's problems with transitions when it's really the motor load of the difficulty, or the motor load of the task that's creating the difficulties. And because many of these children, if you're being bullied and teased and mocked by peers, many of them start to reduce eye contact, withdraw, and look away as a self form of self-protection. And I'm wondering if perhaps this is being misread as uh, some of the features of autism. Very few people get diagnosed with it then, but quite a lot of people have this. So when you haven't been diagnosed with it, maybe you have been diagnosed with something else that maybe is inaccurate, or maybe you've never been diagnosed with anything and you've gone through your whole life. It sounds like most of the work is being done with children and youth here. But presumably, many people get into adulthood with this without ever having figured out what that thing is and presumably have compensated somehow along the way, right? That they've learned to live with it in a certain way, that they do certain tasks a little bit differently. Uh, How does that look for somebody in adulthood? Or does it go away over the course of many years uh, just by virtue of repetitively doing a whole pile of different things until you are able to master those things. I have had the privilege of working with a number of young adults and even older adults who have found out about DCD through some conversations with other people and they just go, oh, this sounds like me. I've always been clumsy. I can't manage I can't manage tasks in the kitchen because I, I can only do one thing at a time. The research shows that many of these people really struggle with employment. So they're often underemployed, they're bright, but they can't perform the tasks at work. Many people with DCD end up being underemployed or they work in a, a field that they don't really care for because it's <clears throat> it's what they can manage. They, they often have trouble doing things quickly as well. And that's a, a, a feature that companies like that you can work quickly and efficiently. Many of these people struggle to learn to drive a car. If you think about all of the items that go together with driving, you have to think about speed, force, direction, where's my vehicle in space, Um, the signs are coming, there's cars behind me, there's an intersection coming. So that's very clear in the research. Um, Often it can affect someone in their relationships. 
again, because they've struggled with social integration as children, and they may be seen as a little bit unique as an adult. If you're misunderstood, people may make judgments about you and or put you in a wrong treatment format where the goals don't match the underlying issues. So then the treatment doesn't really work over time. It's been a very long journey, Eric. I'm not ready to give up yet because I just find this is such a fabulous topic that so few mental health professionals know about. And I just have become aware of the long-term consequences and then um, further mental health difficulties and physical health difficulties. Because if you're not really good in sports and you're not, not really included, you tend to become more sedentary. That's very, very clear in the research on DCD as many of these children develop some obesity. In fact, it's even one of the consequences that's listed in the DSM that it okay. can affect emotional, behavioral issues and result in obesity and later life. So I'm picturing somebody then who hasn't been very active, uh, is sedentary, but I, when I picture that person, I picture them playing video games. Would that be an issue? Would that be something that uh, these people would struggle with as well? Or would there be some of those that would be able to help them in, in that sense? So video games, electronics are really the fabulous tool for this population because remember they're bright, they understand the strategy, but if they don't have to make their body do it, they've got more cognitive room to consider what do I need to do and how can I do it. And repetitive actions, like if you're working with a joystick or just fingers on a keypad, you could become quite proficient at it. Yes, many of these people do follow the trend of entering fields of IT or video games, and they become quite proficient in it. And that also tends to become an area where they develop some social contacts because they're not judged for their external performance tasks at school. Right. Now, you said earlier that the APA's designation of this, right, in the DSM, treats it as strictly a motor skills issue, but that you think it's something more than that and presumably a psychological issue as well. So, but you also said that, right, these motor skill issues create psychological issues because of exclusion from peer groups, because of, you know, an inability and a frustration at trying to complete tasks, which is all very understandable. But I'm wondering if there's any sense of what comes first. Presumably, the motor skill issue comes first and can be observed from infancy in a way, and then the rest of it happens as a result of not being terrific with, with the motor skills. So if that is the case, if I'm right about that, an early intervention presumably could ward off some of that later pain. Would that be an accurate thing to say? It's hard to know because it's really difficult to do a lot of research on really, really young infants. It's really considered a, a mental disorder. And I think fundamentally, it's that the that there's something disrupted or inefficient about the whole cognitive neurological processes, the neurodevelopment of the child. And I think it's manifested motorically, but the child struggles to plan, the child struggles to organize, I think in many cases, the whole sensory motor, the early sensory motor development has some disruptions or that's not coordinated properly. So for example, if you and I have a, a young infant and we live beside a train track, every single time that train came by at three o'clock in the afternoon and that child heard that train whistle and over time, you say, yeah, there's the train, there's the train, that would start to become um, a solid sensory signal. I think some of these children, their sensory signals aren't fully integrated, so that's part where it starts with that incoordination, and then they don't know which signal is the right one or which is the wrong one. And I think that starts off from that early, very early on. If I can give another example, Many of these children, and this is some of the questions I 
always ask my clients. I do quite a thorough historical thing. Many of these infants struggle to nurse. That's the first thing. They can't quite get their mouth to do what it has to do to nurse. And if you think about what's required, the coordination required for just basic nursing, the child has to open the mouth, the child has to latch, the child has to suck, the child has to swallow and breathe, all in the exact proper timing and sequence. So some of these children sputter, or they don't have the strength, or they can't get their tongue to move properly to create that sucking pattern. So that says to me that the motor planning and the neurological development is, is kind of impacted right together at the same time. This being then a psychological issue, is there a psychological treatment for it? Can you get over this? Can you be cured of this? Can you get completely better? Or is it just a way of managing it as you go on with your life? What is the treatment pattern for this? Again, having worked in this for a couple of decades, I would say the first step is the right diagnosis. And when you have an opportunity to share this with the parents, Typically, it's a three-word <laughs> OMG. Why have I never heard of this? This makes perfect sense. That explains why my child struggled in this way. I've been telling people at school for years, my child wants to play, but they've pegged him in a different way. And then you start to see this real intense anger on the part of the parent. So you have to kind of calm that down. So the first thing is knowing what you're dealing with. When you know what the proper diagnosis is, then you can speak to the different ways of treatment. So again, do you want to look at occupational therapy, physiotherapy? Those are forms that work quite well. I happen to use a slightly different approach, and that's I use a metacognitive approach. I saw on some of your recent speakers, they talked about mind-body, mm -hmm. but this I think is a real classic mind-body. When you can inform a child that their body is not doing what their mind tells them, they almost always say, that's exactly what it feels like. Dr. Camps, I know what I want to do, but I can't get my body to do it. So then you break it down into, okay, what are the main steps you want to conquer here? The main tasks you want to master? How can we simplify those things? You learn one or two of these really, really well, then you add another step to it. So it's like backwards chaining. Um, or you work on just the functional skills you want to learn and you let certain things go. But the long and short of it is it doesn't go away. It is a lifelong condition. So you learn to figure out what tools you need. You learn that you need more time to process and coordinate all of the tasks that are coming at you. But because you're bright, you can speak openly to your teacher, to your coach, to your employer to say, this is what I need to be successful. These are highly sensitive individuals that really want to work and have a, a good income. Um, I've had a number of people from uh, medical professional parents who said, this is me. And look at my writing. I like I still, I struggled in school. I didn't go along with the sports crowd because I couldn't do it. So I put my head to the books and I studied everything I could about the human body because it fascinated me and I went into a different field. So there is no shortage of, of these individuals to learn and to achieve in adulthood, but they do need accommodations. But the key is when they understand what's going on, it's like that explains so much. And then we often, or not we, but in my work with students, we often try to address the social and emotional piece, the emotional regulation piece, because they've been dealing with that frustration and anger for so long. But now there's a, there's a reason for it that reduces some of that concern right away. And then we just work on the how you probably should have been treated. Okay. How, how do you go forward from here? If somebody's listening to this right now and they think, you know, that sounds a lot like my kid, my Kids having some issues, had some issues nursing, is stumbling a little as an infant, uh, you know, this sort of thing, penmanship. 
or somebody who is an adult who might think, wait a second, that sounds like it describes all of my childhood and now here I am. Where can they go? How can they go about getting a diagnosis and then getting a plan for managing it at this stage? Uh, would a, your general practitioner know about this or would you have to go to a specialist? Uh, where would you go? That's the dilemma, Eric, and that's why I, I refuse to give up so far. Very few doctors know about it. In 2012, I was part of a research group where we looked at almost 2,000 doctors, parents, and teachers. Hardly any of them had ever heard about DCD. I get calls from around the world. I get messages from around the world. Can I please help them? My regulatory body in Alberta Canada does not permit me to work across bound, um, borders, provincial borders, so that's a huge limitation. I have written a couple of books on the topic. People are more than welcome to look me up online, www.drkamps.ca, where they'll learn a little bit more. There's a free checklist on my website if they want to dig around a bit more. Again, you would probably... You would probably have to be a self-advocate. So again, if you want that free checklist to help yourself, you could take that to your medical practitioner and say, I think there's something going on here. But that's my desperation to get this message out because the more mental health professionals that know about this, this is going to be a field that is ripe for growth when it starts to become more understood. I have every confidence to believe that my colleagues would do fantastic in this, but um, I mean, the background training in the motor field is something that they'd have to get some extra help in. I'm hoping to perhaps offer some training in the fall if I have an interest. And for anyone who's on the CPA, the, the educational psychology group is going to be posting an article that I wrote in the May newsletter and I get to present in Toronto in uh, four weeks, so Terrific. it's so insane. <laughs> well, I will see you there. And this is why I love doing this podcast because I'm learning so many things that I would not otherwise have heard about bulbodynia, DCD, right? And uh, hopefully these things will become more well known by others as a result. And we'll try to get the message out there as best we can. We will put a link to your website in the show notes. So anybody who's listening to this now can go into the show notes and click on that link. Uh, Dr. Pauline Camps, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today about DCD. Oh, I so appreciate your interest and for helping to spread the word. Please check out the show notes for more information, papers, and websites dedicated to DCD. Thanks to everyone at home for tuning in, streaming, downloading, and leaving a review. Thanks also to Jamie Montgomery for producing and editing this episode, and to David Taylor for gifting us with his song Avenues, the mindful theme music. Today's episode was written, hosted, and published by me, Eric Bowman. All of us at the Canadian Psychological Association are off to Toronto for our annual convention starting tomorrow, uh, the one Pauline mentioned earlier in this episode. See you all in two weeks.